Hi Soul, it's Friday, it's Pod O'Clock, and it's Dragonheart. The new owners have offered a series of bonuses to the players. £200 for a win, £50 for a draw, and a quarter of a million quid if they can stop Steve Cleave talking about Wrexham. Let it go, let it go, we can't remember who you are anymore. The conditions were against us this week. Dean Keats opted not to risk Jay Harris at Aldershot when he saw the state of the playing surface. It was the worst pitch since Colin Poole tried to convince us to trust him with our club. Everybody's missing the experience of going to football matches. To recreate that experience of being in the race course last Tuesday, try watching the highlights with your front window wide open while the neighbour stands outside spraying you with a hose pipe. We'll look back on the last week's matches, check to legendary battler Roger Priest, and talk about other tough competitors who played for Wrexham. Plus, we pay a birthday tribute to Hector Sam. I'm Mark Griffiths, and I'm joined by Che Long. So, let's get cracking. It's time for Dragonheart. I'm Elliot Dorrell, and you're listening to the Dragonheart Radio Show. Hi, well, welcome to Dragonheart, then. We've got a packed agenda today. We'll be looking back on our last two games, and also hearing from Roger Priest, 1980s cult hero, and paying tribute to Hector Sam, whose birthday was yesterday. I'm joined, of course, by Che Long. Hi, Che. Hi, how's it going, mate? Not bad. I see you've actually travelled back in time this time. I like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. For the for the audio listeners, I've got the famous LDV Vans trophy lifting picture behind me on the backdrop. So yeah, Brilliant. iconic. Um, I I've got to say, I always get angry when people on podcasts and radio do visual stuff, and there I am starting off by doing visual stuff. Thanks for pointing <laughs> out some people are listening to this. I will also point out to those listeners that there's a, a, a exploding firework behind Shay, so I hope you've got a bucket of water nearby just in case. <laughs> health and safety. Yes, health and safety, of course, <laughs> definitely. Excellent. Right. So, so let's crack on. And after this, we'll be talking about, well, I'm afraid, that game at Aldershot. The other side, you're listening to the Dragonheart Radio. Well, yeah, let's get the unpleasant business out of the way first. Aldershot, Jay, was uh, not good, was it? No, I, it, <laughs> if we could, I would avoid talking about it, to be <laughs> honest, but... Uh, yeah, it was a bit of a mess, wasn't it? Totally. And, and, and the really annoying thing for me was that you know, we'd both seen a bit of Aldershot beforehand. We They had a lot of injuries and suspensions. They were struggling for confidence. I mean, if anybody listening to the stream will have heard their commentators and their pundits, firstly, lacking confidence in their team's ability to get anything from us. I don't know if you heard it, but the, the, the people who, who handed over to the stream, there were three of them, they all made predictions. The first, the commentator apologised to Wrexham fans saying, oh, I'm sorry, you know, we're all biased. So when we give our predictions, you might not like it. But then out of the three of them, I think it was one draw and two wins for Wrexham, they predicted. And the commentators were stunned when, when Aldershot were beating us. The fact is, the first 15 minutes went the way I expected. We played them off the pitch, totally dominant, really one-sided game, but we didn't take advantage of it, did we? No, um, we had our chances, didn't we? We had that weird um, boot and dibble did over the top and it just sort of bounced in front yeah. of the keeper, didn't it? And it sort of, Angus could have directed it anywhere and I think it into any of the corners and it could have gone in, but he, mm. he sort of headed it and it went, went straight to the keeper's hands, didn't it? And yeah, yeah we, 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 I think we probably could have been one or two up at 15 minutes. Mm. I thought we were the better side. We created chances, but... Ultimately, it was that um, misfortune by um, the defend our defenders, Tyler French and Dibble at Costas, really, wasn't it, in the first half? Yeah, and I, I think that, that sadly, um, it's, it's Dibble who has to, well, hold his hand up. Um, <laughs> a bit better than he held his hands up to that one, um, uh, sadly. Uh, but we, we have to remember, goalkeepers do make mistakes. I mean, after that, I was very impressed by the fact that he bounced back. He didn't let it get to him. 
and he made a lot of good saves. And again, against Hartlepool, good clean sheet, and he was solid and good in the air. Um, but, you know, these things happen. Uh, right, okay, obviously it's bad that it happens, and I'd rather it didn't, and, and it's, it's down to Dibble, essentially. But, ultimately, the, the real problem of that was that the team seemed to take it like a punch in the guts and yeah. and collapsed. And that's the real concern for me, rather than say, right, okay, we're better than these. We'll just go back out there now. We're playing like we'll score three goals past them. We'll just carry on playing like this and we'll get three goals past them. But instead, the team seemed to clap. And I think all the shots, you know, maybe had a little bit of a, a boost suddenly thinking, hello, maybe we can get at these. And, and then the yeah. next hour of the game, we're all, it was really poor, wasn't it? Yeah, they seemed really up for it, didn't they? Mm. To be fair, you, you've got to give them that. that new, is it new ball? Oh, yeah, yeah. he looked awesome, didn't he? Yeah, uh, yeah. The commentators are actually saying he can be very up and down. He either yeah. looks really good or he looks poor, but he he looked really good. And I, For me, the most disappointing thing from Saturday wasn't losing. I'm not bothered about losing. I, I, you know, if, if we're going to be in the playoffs, you're not going to win every game, are yeah. you? You're not yeah. going to draw every game. I think it was the manner in which we lost. Yeah. But going into the first, going into the second half, I actually thought we'll get back into this. Mm. I said, to, I said to my brother, I said, "Oh, we'll, we'll be back into this. Mm. Well, I think we'll win this." And then straight off the mark, a deflected goal. Yeah. yeah. There was some misfortune, Is isn't there? I suppose in that. I mean, the, f- the first element's misfortune. The first goal. That's one of our players' faults. So okay, we, we have to accept that. That big deflection's unlucky. Um, and I had a similar feeling. We've done that quite a few times this season, haven't we? They've, they've put in a poor first half performance. They've gone in, uh, Keats and Davis and Darlington have got in amongst them, and they've come out with a, it. Just feels like a clearer sense of what they're trying to do. Wheelstone was the obvious example of that, and also yeah. Weymouth. Um, yeah. But yeah, that that deflected goal seemed to set them back again to where they were in the first half. And when the third one went in, I thought we were in for a right battering, to be honest with you. I was really good. Only, only Dibble was, was stopping us from having suffering that, I think. They'd last... Yeah. Um, they they oh. were... They, that, I want to say their third goal was great as well. Great dribbling by yeah, Newblay, yeah. wasn't it? Um, yeah. Also, I knew when that second goal went in, I knew it was over. You could yeah. just tell, couldn't you? It was one of those games. The pitch was horrendous as well, which I don't think helped. No, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to make excuses. I don't mind losing. I think it was just the manner in which we lost. And I think the one thing I'd like to talk about was: Would you have started Jarvis over Horsfield for that game? Um, I've got to be honest. I, I, not necessarily. I understand, you know, why the question is, has been asked by you and by a few other people, and because when you change a side, that's one and leave out a player who played well in that, and then perform like we did on Saturday? <laughs> it's a natural question. Um, I I would say, well, okay, from my point of view, beforehand, I assumed Jay Harris would be fit again, and I assumed Harris would take Jarvis's place. Yeah. As Dean Keats said, I mean, Horsfield has played that midfield role in the Football League. He's played it in the Eredivisie. You know, he's a, he's a perfectly capable midfielder with a lot of experience. So although we've not really seen him play in midfield much, that's not him picking a full-back out of position. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think I'm right in saying he's played more of his professional career as a midfielder than as a right-back. Um, it's also, as we know, um, Keith said, it's also because we'd scouted all the shot and we knew they had a dangerous player who'd go up and support the striker. And then, as it turned out, Aldershot dropped off their team, including that player, and didn't play that formation that we expected. So we were partly and um, you know looking to nullify something they do, and then they didn't do it. Yeah, um, but that, that's misfortune, isn't it? If you keep scouting and knowing having good information about the other side, you're going to gain a lot more points than you lose through that. But that was unfortunate. So, I mean, I just think um, having Jarvis and Davis in midfield does give you more creativity. One would hope. Um, but it also makes it a little more likely that the opposition are going to be able to run through the middle of you. Yeah. Um, and I don't mean that as a criticism. And in fact, Davis, I think uh, uh, when he plays in centre mid, battles like hell. But Jarvis is much more of a, a forward thinking, creative player. He'll come back and do his shift, but he's he's not. You know, if, if Jay Harris or James Horsfield in that position surely are going to give you a bit more steel in an away game on a difficult pitch yeah. when the team might try and put a three. So I, 
I, I, I, yeah, I could see why he did that. I could have seen why if he put Jarvis in, but I could see why he did that. I mean, the first 15 minutes is what we were trying to achieve, and we achieved it. And frankly, the last 15 were. Now, I accept that by then, all the shots have pretty much won it, and I think they were sitting back and inviting us on a bit, and they, they took their foot at the gas a bit. Um, but ludicrous as it might sound, we made more than three easy chances in the last 15 minutes and missed them all. I don't think we, you know, I'm not saying we would have made all those chances if the first one had gone in, but, you know, we had we had two big penalty shouts in the game, both of which, looking back on the video, really look to be penalties. The Jarvis one's absolutely 100% penalty. I don't see how the ref didn't give it. The handball, quite frankly, I think probably you'd only not give it if you didn't see it properly. So, you know, I mean, I, I'm not trying to make excuses. I'm not trying to pretend we were good. But we could have scored five goals in that game despite not, despite not playing very well. And it sounds ludicrous, but we, we could have done. For me, Dior Angus had to do a lot better with a lot of his chances. Yeah. I think he sh- a lot of the shots he was taking, they didn't even go sa- either side of the keeper. They, mm. they were easy saves for the goalkeeper, so he needs to be doing better. Even though I know he, I do really rate him. I do really like him. I think he's a good player. Uh, but he needs to be do, doing better with those chances, doesn't he? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I also really rate him. And I think that since he's come in, apart from this week, we've looked a lot more able to cause problems. Oh, actually, no, I'll take that back. In older shot, we certainly looked like we could cause problems. We just couldn't finish them. Um, that headed chance you mentioned earlier was a hell of a good chance. If you just get the right contact on that, you've scored. Um, although I have a small element of sympathy for him because, like you said, it's a massive kick by Dibble that's gone through the middle of them, which tells us how vulnerable they were. A long kick by the keeper shouldn't end with a striker one-on-one. Um, but I guess, to be fair, he's got to judge when he can hit it. <laughs> if it's not if it's not in the right spot, if he beats too late, the keeper's going to come out and clatter into him and the ball. If he tries to reach it too soon, he's going to mistime it. You know, you know. There's you just if you time that right, you score. If you don't time it right, you probably don't. Um, the open goal in the second half was was much worse. To be honest, with that great shot from Jarvis and the keeper pushed it out and just oh, has to yeah. score that one. Uh, and I like you said, they were, for a memory. <laughs> they were they were sorry. There were a few. You know that lovely um, first time ball by Jarvis that put him in on goal. And he hit it first time, which I understand why, but he didn't get all of it properly. And like you say, straight at the keeper, he had a chance then cutting in didn't he, from the flank, which he does well, well, but he didn't get hold of the shot straight at the keeper. And yeah, he'll have looked at himself and thought, yeah, I'm disappointed with that. Um, I just, I thought it was interesting. I, I'm really finding Keats's post-match was <laughs> interesting. He really does analyse what happened. Uh, I don't think he used to, and he does that. Um, and I thought it was interesting him saying that because the pitch was dead and because Kwame Thomas was bullying their centre-backs, that maybe, with hindsight, we should have stopped trying to play through the middle and just knock it long for Kwame and get players feeding off him um, yeah. and you know I think he regretted in hindsight that we didn't go long because Thomas is capable of doing that he was doing that um, and we weren't passing well so you know why the heck not I think sometimes when especially at our level it's not the Premier League is it you, you know you can you can get away you can win by not playing pretty at all can't you yeah, by yeah. playing route one, route one football and we have Kwame Thomas who I think really suits that sort of target man route one football mm. he's also very good with the ball at his feet so I think he's a very good striker to have for us at our level mm. um, but yeah it, it's, it's a game looking back at older shot now it, it's a game that I'd like to forget <laughs> but they've seemed to kick on after it haven't they as well so yeah I don't think they're a terrible side. I think they're looking to get a last hit of form, aren't they, and try and sneak yeah. into the playoffs. I think everyone on the top half of the table is looking to do that at the moment. And uh, there's a lot of eyes on Wrexham, so I think a lot of a lot of these teams are actually really, um, really up in their game against us, which is unfortunate for us. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it's one of them. I, I don't mind lo- losing. Uh, I think it's just the manner of the way we lo- lost. But, yeah, uh, there's not really much more to say about that game, is there? It's happened. That's all we can yeah. say about it, isn't it? I don't know. Yeah. Well, well, one, one, oh, on. one thing I'd like to say is I think Durrell and Jarvis, when they come on, they played really well. That's one yeah. thing I'd like to say. And I think we sh- maybe we should utilise Durrell a little bit more, especially with the Wheelston game coming up. I think he could do really well against a team like that. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, he had his chance at the start of the season, lost his place, but he looks he's looked lively coming on as a sub. He was busy against Hartlepool without creating too many chances, but 
Um, yeah, I, I think it'd be interesting to see if we can utilise him. And like with Jarvis, you were saying about if we have to go long, something that pleases me about Jarvis is that Keats, when he uses him, does tend to try and use him very high at the pitch. He, mm-hmm. He's playing off the front too. He's not dropping off in, in midfield as much. And Jarvis does get ahead of, of Thomas. You know, you, you watch when we're knocking it long. Angus, you know, obviously is looking to run off him, but Jarvis gets ahead of him as well. And I like that. I like I like the idea of having you know a couple of players looking for those flick-ons. It should make us dangerous when we have to use that tactic. Yeah, it's better than just launching it long at him and he's stuck on his own up front, which has happened yeah. in the first <laughs> half of this part of the season. And then he might win it. He might you know, but there's no one to get to the second ball. He might hold it up, but he's got to hold it up for a long time and do really well, which he can do. But it's hard to ask him to do it all game. Instead, he's got two runners going off him, and if he gets the right flick on, we're in on goal. Exactly. Route one, come on, let's, let's go Wimbledon on this. Let's go John Beck. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of John Beck, oh, oh, the segues, the segues are flowing. <laughs> <laughs> I've summoned the spirit of the Segway God. Speaking of John Beck, whose may- heyday, of course, was the 80s and 90s, I had a chance to have a chat to a real cult hero of Wrexham's, Roger Priest, from those days. And so after this, we can hear what he's up to now and his memories of playing at the race course. I'm Riesel Johnson and you're listening to the Dragon Heart Radio Show. Well, Roger, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's very good of you, of you to give up some of your time to actually talk to us this evening. No problem. Pleasure. Pleasure to be asked and uh, relive some, some good memories from my Wrexham days, really. Well, I certainly, I certainly enjoyed watching you play. You came in under Dixie, of course. And, yeah. well, wait, am I right? You made your debut in a European game, I think, didn't you? That's right, yeah. I'd, uh, I joined Wrexham from Coventry City, um, where I'd sort of like served my... Uh, apprenticeship uh, and then I was recommended to to Dixie by John Sillett. John Sillett was my youth team manager at Coventry and then he managed to get, he got the first team job uh, and obviously a year later managed to take Coventry to the FA Cup final and obviously win it. Uh, he, he obviously recommended me to Dixie and, and yeah, I came up uh, in 1986 and, and signed my first professional contract and was lucky enough to make me debut in the Cup Winners' Cup tie in Zuri Egg of Malta. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, that was really nice, really, to, to make a professional debut and to do it in Europe was, uh, was great. Yeah, it must have been, uh, you know, a, a lot of people say this, they come to Wrexham and the shock of thinking, hang on, we, we play in Europe here. That must, yeah. you know, it attracts players in, but it, it's, a, you know, it's a fantastic experience, isn't it? Yeah, well, I, like I say, I didn't really know until, you know, I'd, obviously I, I was aware that there was, you know, European entry through the Welsh Cup, but, uh, you know, I hadn't really, wasn't on my radar that Wrexham had, had qualified, mm. you know, for Europe when I signed, and then it was obviously mentioned, and then, uh, and I obviously played against Zurich and then managed to get, like, Real Zaragoza in the next round, which was, which was amazing, just to go and experience that, you know, in front of 30,000 fans in in Zaragoza, it was brilliant. Although I, I was sub and didn't get on, it was just, it's like I say, it's what you dream of, being involved on with a team on nights like that. And, and that season, well, you know, you were a new young player, so you got some experience, but the next season was when, well, we really started to lean on you and, and you got quite a lot of pitch time, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Like I say, the, the first year at 18, um, you know, I didn't get a, a great deal of game time. I... Uh, you know, maybe debut sort of like I think my league debut in 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 the February um, against Rochdale, and I had, didn't have the greatest of games. Ended up uh, getting substituted after about sixty seventy minutes, and game passed me by a little bit. And and then towards the end of the season, I think Dixie had kind of like made the decision to to give me a run of you know the last four or five games of the season, and and they went really well. You know, I was really pleased with. You know, you know the, the way they'd gone. That was in my first season, and then managed to secure sort of like a regular berth, pretty much for for the season following, which was what you mentioned. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I think I probably played thirty odd, thirty odd games that season. So, um, so yeah, you know, it was it was a pretty regular season for me. Had some good players at that time as well. Um, 
you know, Joey was there, wasn't he? And he had nice players like, I don't know, Jeff Hunter and John Bowden midfield. Mike. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a, a really good team. You know, again, it was you know you only you only really ran on a on a small squad, and mm. I'm pretty certain in those days it, there was only two subs on the bench as well. You know, so yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it was kind of like uh, you know the, the, you know the squad was you know really really thin but it, I mean it was great for a youngster like me because it meant that I could be involved and if I wasn't playing I was on the bench so um, so yeah it, it, I certainly benefited by by being a smaller squad I've got to say as well you, you, you play, although we're pretty much the same age we played with uh, you played with my sort of childhood hero Jim Steele I always remember just, yeah. I used to enjoy yeah. him bullying centre-backs <laughs> yeah, well, Jim was great. You know, he didn't have the, you know, the the best of legs. He was never going to run into the channels for you, but he was a good old traditional target man, and you know, you could always rely on him. And he had a great knack of, of, of popping up with goals. So, uh, so yeah, I think he did a great job for Rex in the time that he was there. And a, a, another striker who was there at the same time as you, a different style, uh, was Kevin Russell. And of course, you were there when he really those two seasons when he really caught fire and, and couldn't stop scoring goals. Yeah, he did. He was great. I mean, he, he, he was brilliant for us. I think, you know, the hardest thing and to, to do is put the ball in the net. And uh, and obviously, I think we, it was Portsmouth we got Kevin from and he came up and, and he did a you know terrific job and went on to have a really good career, didn't he? You know, played for some good clubs and some big teams, Stoke and Leicester and, uh, and did really well for himself. He was so quick, wasn't he? I mean, yeah, was... go on, quick, sorry. Fin- good finisher as well. So, yeah, it um, it was it was great to have him on board. I remember him scoring a hat trick against Exeter, and I was on the cop, and two of them were like impossible angles. One with his yeah. right foot, and one with his left on the other side of the box. And I just remember thinking, God, just to meet one of those finishes would been quite something. But uh... yeah. Yeah, no, he, he was. He, he, and he was a great lad as well. You yeah. know, he was a really, really popular in the dressing room. And, and that's quite an affinity with Rex. I mean, he came back and coached, I think, didn't he, for yeah, some yeah. time? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he yeah. came back later when he'd slowed down a lot, but he was a very yeah. intelligent midfielder then. Yeah. And then coached yeah. as well, yeah. Yeah, no, that's right. No, that's good. He's, I think he's at Stoke now, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. We're benefiting from it, actually, because uh, <laughs> we've had a few decent young lads come from Stoke. Oh, that's good. Uh, yeah, that's good. so it's uh, they're, they're nice, te- nice technical players. You can see yeah. what sort of players he likes, you know. Yeah. But, uh, and and also with him scoring in goals, uh, we got into the playoffs. You had a really good season, but you were injured at the end of the season, I believe, when well the playoffs actually took place. Yeah, well, I, ju- I just fell out of favour a little bit, I think, as well. So I'd been. You know, pretty regular, if I can remember rightly, that season, and then kind of like just just fell out of favour, and uh, and yeah, didn't really didn't make the squad, which was a bit like I say, disappointing. But again, it was those days where there's only two subs. You know, I had yeah. five, I might have been able to to have crept in on the bench, but uh, you know, yeah, like I say, the, over the playoff games, a mixture of sort of like. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't remember. I think it might. I think I was fit. It was just. Yeah, I think my form, my form might have suffered prior to that, or I might have been suspended and then couldn't get back in the team. Um, I can't quite remember which one it was, if I'm honest. But, uh, but yeah, it would have been nice to have took part in it. Obviously, I was involved. You know, went to the, went to the playoff games, and uh, yeah, just a shame at Orient. We uh, we couldn't uh, couldn't get over the line. I uh, uh, then as well. The next season, well, it was it was well, firstly, a bit of a disaster when we could have gone down, and also bewildering to a lot of fans, certainly including myself, that at, at the end of it we released you because it just didn't seem to make sense. Well, um, yeah, like I say, I think I think Dixie went, didn't he? The start yeah. of my last season, he yeah. ended up resigning, and, and Brian Flynn took over. Um, and it was probably fair to say I'd had a couple of disciplinary issues, mm. sort of like, you know, off the field a little bit, which I didn't think went down particularly well w- with Brian Flynn. Um, you know, and then, um, I, like I said, there was one particular incident at Christmas time. And then, you know, I was out of the team. And then by default, really, there was no, nobody else really to play. We were that thin on the ground for players. 
I ended up sort of like getting in. I think Neil Salathiel had got a hamstring injury and I played pretty much all the games from um, Christmas really to April, you know, and had a good yeah. run of games. And then um, obviously players got fit, came back. We'd managed to stay up. Um, I was left out of the team and the contract was up and, and never got offered another contract, which, uh, you know, was was disappointing. But, you know, it didn't come as a shock, really. Um, you know, it, it, it was what it was. I think perhaps I was a bit young, I was a bit hot-headed, and I think perhaps uh, Brian saw that and um, thought perhaps my career was best away from, from Wrexham. So, you know, at the time... I was a probably, you know, disappointed and bitter. But as you get older and you get a bit more experienced, you understand the decisions that were made on you, if that makes sense. I can yeah. understand where Brian came from, uh, making the decision that he had at that time with my probably ill discipline. So, you know, it's, uh, it was what it was, really. You're certainly well, well known for your tackling. Um and the sort of player would relish a tough occasion. And you managed that, that dream achievement for a Wrexham uh, player of scoring at the, in the derby at Chester as well, didn't you, in, in a cup tie? Yeah, that was probably one of my most memorable moments. Certainly, you know, amongst sort of like Wrexham supporters, you know, it's, it's amazing the amount of people that, you know, perhaps mention that to me or it pops <laughs> up on Facebook every now and again. So, you know, it, it was quite, uh, quite an honour really to to score the winner in the derby. I don't think Wrexham had beaten Chester for a while. I know mm. um, the couple of years before that, that Wrexham had knocked, um, uh, sorry, Chester had knocked Wrexham out of both the FA Cup and I think it was the old Freight Rover, wasn't yeah, it, in, yeah. in the one season. So, uh, so to go there and obviously win at Chester and get the winner, uh, yeah, it was a, a very memorable moment. I think I've got that picture <laughs> oh, my mum and dad have got that picture framed on the wall at, at, at home. So, so yeah, it's, it's a nice one to look back on. It shows how times have changed. I remember that very clearly because I was in hospital. And oh, were you? I, of course, yeah. in those days before the internet, I had yeah. to wait till the evening leader came out the next day to find <laughs> out the score because no, none of the nurses knew. Yeah. I we're being thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what's that now? It's kind of like 33 80. years ago, is it? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, 87. Yeah. Was it eighty eight? Yeah. So yeah, I don't know where the time's gone. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I remember seeing the back page with the, with the picture of your goal. You're diving in to score, and yeah. thinking, "Oh yes, I must." Yeah. Probably the picture that's made me most happy to see an no. and We won there, so thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Uh, like I say, it's one of the most memorable moments. To be fair, I didn't have that many, but well, I don't, uh, I've done on a great, done a great. <laughs> <laughs> but no, Hello. that was it. Although that picture had a sad ending for me because when I woke up the next morning, somebody had pinched me paper. So, oh, nightmare. <laughs> I was nightmare. gutted. I was so thrilled to receive it. Don't worry, I'd read all about <laughs> the game, but still. <laughs> Good. The, um, so that, it must, that goal must have gone down well when you then signed for Chester, eh? <laughs> it, it kind of like glossed over, really, when I went to Chester uh, scoring that goal. Um, like I say, it, uh, I think it was one of them, them nights for a Chester supporter to, to be forgotten about, really. Yeah, I think so, absolutely. One final question. Um, it's just a, well, a player that he didn't actually play for Wrexham alongside, but he was a major player for Wrexham, was Jake King. And he yeah. had a big influence later on, I think, in getting you involved more in coaching, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, Jake's been a, you know, been a massive influence you know, on my on my football career really, certainly in the latter years. Um, mm. I know when I went to when I went to Chester, after I got freed from Chester, I ended up dropping into non league for, for twelve months and then I went to Telford United and Jake was manager of Telford United. Mm. Um, and I'd had a good couple of months under Jake and I think Jake could see something in me. And when he got the ma the manager's job at Shrewsbury Town he took me with him as a as a player coach. So I'd had sort of like uh, nearly three years with Jake at Shrewsbury and then uh, Jake got sacked at Shrewsbury and I more or less followed him to Telford from Shrewsbury so we had sort of like a good six years together you know coaching and playing and you know I owe a lot to Jake really he was a great player when he played for Shrewsbury he used to go and watch him playing for Shrewsbury coming from Shropshire uh, and I was a big fan of his you know when he played for Shrewsbury and obviously yes he, he you know he went to Wrexham and 
starred in that memorable victory over Porto, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. And as a strong character on the pitch and a, and a hard tackling right back, I know you played right midfield as well. A good yeah. role model as a player for someone like you as well, is that? Yeah, yeah, he was. I mean, he, he was strong on and off the field. You didn't mess with him. You know, I like to say on or on or off the field. Uh, he was he was a very strong character and Glaswegian. Knew what he wanted, you know, and uh, driven. Yeah, he, he was great. I learned, you know, learned a lot from him. Well, that is honestly, it's been brilliant to talk to you, Roger. It really has. It's been a a, a pleasure to to remember some some great games. Yeah, no problem. It's, it's, it's been nice having a chat and, and talking about it. Thanks for the call. I'm Fiacre Kelleher, and you're listening to Dragon Heart Radio Show. Oh, Roger Priest, he brings back lots of great memories for me. Real feisty customer and a really wholehearted player for Wrexham. And someone who wasn't scared of picking up a card in the Call of Duty, which leads us on to the essential discussion, Wrexham Hard Men. <laughs> I tell you what. <laughs> I got. That. Have you got any favourites? I've got a couple of nice ones. Oh, Ooh. Lee McEvely probably. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Lee McEvely was. Well, yeah, he, he. Would you class? Yeah, he was a hard man, wasn't he? Because it's hard to find hard man this day and age. I think because mm. football's changed a lot, and I don't think the game actually allows real hard men anymore, does it? Yeah. yeah. I think someone like Jay Harris is a hard man because he. Yeah, he yeah. He's a bit like a he's like a pit bull, isn't he? He really he's back and forth. He's, he's getting bucked all the time. Dean Keats was as well, I think. Yeah, yeah. He well, was Joe really... Jacob was. Um, I've often mentioned him in podcasts. Joe Jacob was a midfielder, played for Chester, um, played for Burnley for a long time, and played in the Eredivisie actually for AZ Alkmaar. And after he finished, he was coaching. He was he was Gareth Bale's youth coach at Southampton. But after he sort of stepped back a bit from the coaching and playing, um, he had a little sort of a part-time job, which a lot of uh, players did, of doing the PA data at matches, so that all those tackles and shots and all that sort of thing. And he was he was Wrexham's man. And so he'd always sit up next to me in the, the commentary box. Lovely, lovely bloke. Wonderful stories about football. But he, he I mean, I, I've got to say, you know, he was playing in the 80s. He knew how to leave a foot in. You know, I mean, he could look after himself, but he yeah. would always say, Keats and Harris, they want to be careful. Yeah. It's mad the way they're diving in. And I'm thinking, that's a man who played in the 70s and the 80s. Yeah. I think that that shows yeah. they were a couple of little tough nuts, doesn't it? You know? Oh, yeah. And I, I think they, they definitely were. They, I'd class them as hard men. Mm. Uh, Crichton as well, maybe oh, just his sheer, yeah. sheer size. Mm. I, I can't really remember him being too clumsy and big challenges because probably he would get sent off wouldn't he with his sheer size <laughs> of him a lot if he was li- really lunging into tackles uh, Neil Ashton didn't he he was, he oh, was yeah. a bit, he, he'd be up for it as well wouldn't he yeah, like, yeah. I think that whole 98 point season team we were quite a nasty hard team to play <laughs> against weren't we they could look after themselves they were quite physical weren't yeah. they and, and not only yeah. you know players like that I mean Danny Wright can handle himself yeah. Uh, uh, Andy Morrell, you know, maybe people wouldn't look at him quite in that sense, but he, he was he was an irritant for the centre backs, constantly physically working them. I remember very clearly one of his early games was at Bath, and he, Danny Wright and Jake Spate played up front. We played for an hour, sort of with a better team, but weren't really making chances. Um, but then Morrell brought them off after about sixty-five minutes, put him and Cheeslebitch on, and we tore them apart. And he said, basically, it's because of space and right. Because they have exhausted... They worked so hard physically against those centre-backs. They wore them down. And then you put on yeah. a quick lad and a bloke with a bit of nouse and, and you start banging the goals in them because you, the centre-backs are, <laughs> are, are damaged goods. Yeah, Marvin Andrews, so, there's hard lad. Yeah, definitely Mar- Marvin Andrews. Wow. I read his really autobiography good. in one go. When we bought him, I was so excited... I, I, got, I managed to get off Amazon or whatever, his autobiography, and I read it in one go. His debut was at Eastbourne. It's a long train trip. And I read the whole thing in one go going down to Eastbourne. And the bit that sticks in my head was him saying that when he was a kid in Trinidad, he didn't have any money. And he'd play with barefoot on jagged rocks. I thought, yeah, he's quite tough, him. Yeah. I remember Mark yeah. Fighton saying the first time he played alongside him, 
he was saying, what, what the heck is this? He's Crichton was, you know, comes in thinking, <laughs> I'm, I'm the stopper. You know, that's why my job is when the ball's in the air, the other centre-back covers for me and I get up and I edit to the halfway line. And he said, he stands alongside Marvin Andrews at York and then Andrews, he was like, like a blink, and I, okay, I'm the guy on the cover here because Andrews is just tearing at the ball and heading it 30 yards into the other side half. He was Love something it. else he was. Love and he it. looked scary, didn't he? He's a like, scarred face. He looked frightening. So I think, like, I think my generation of fans, we'd never really seen a really, you know, really, you know, real typical Vinnie Jones, t- tough man sort of thing, because I don't think the game allows for it, does it, anymore? Right, so yeah. who, are your, who are your experiences of a hard man from you watching from more back in the day? Well, I'll say the obvious first, Joey Jones. Yeah. Joey Jones, you'd never see a more committed football than Joey. Um, there's a few, I mean... <laughs> If you get his autobiography, oh, this, the stories he tells are some of the stuff that, that happened. I could quickly borrow one of them. Uh, we drew Tottenham in the League Cup in the well, maybe very late 70s, possibly early 80s, at the old White Hart Lane. And the East Stand was getting rebuilt. So Spurs changed in changing rooms at the ground. Across the road, anyone who's been to the old White Hart Lane, there was a narrow road behind the stand, and then there was a school. And so Wrexham changed in a porter cabin in the yard of the school. So the first half, Wrexham were, were you know, so doing all right. Um, but Spurs had that from Steve Archibald, who was a genuine quality striker. When he, he left them to go to Barcelona, he was really good for Barcelona. And Joey uh, tells the story that he wasn't a nice man, Steve Archibald. He was the sort of bloke who, when the ball was nowhere near, was constantly like, treading on your toes and trying to do stuff to wind you up so you, you lose concentration or even retaliate and get sent off. And Joey was playing alongside Wayne Sigalski, who was a very good centre-back. He was not in any way as experienced as Joey. And he was picking up Archibald, and Archibald was doing all that sort of stuff, standing on his toes, doing different things. And so Joey kept saying to him, keep calm, keep calm. And it was ironic, Joey saying, keep calm. <laughs> and he said, so keep calm. Don't react, don't react, don't react. Count to ten. If he does anything, count to ten. So they went in at half-time. And Joey, senior pro, says to Alvon Griffiths, the manager, and says, well, he said, look, he's, he's really winding Wayne up here, you know. And Alvon says, okay, well, you're experienced. You take him in the second half. So he said, oh, okay. So they came out for the second half. And early in the second half, um, <laughs> Archibald spat on Joey. And so Joey went one, two, three, and I punched him. <laughs> and got sent off. So he has to walk down the tunnel. Walk through, of course, he's not going into changing rooms because we're not changing in there. He has to go out of the ground, cross the road, <laughs> get into the car park, and the caretaker's locked the porter cabin. <laughs> so he said, he just, yeah, <laughs> you're not supposed to be in the ground really, are you, when you get sent off? So he, had to, he just sat on the steps of the porter cabin until <laughs> the game ended and all the players are coming back. How do we do? We lost 2 0. All right, now. So, wow, this totally. Champions League, it's mad thinking this Champions League winner who's sitting, yeah. <laughs> sitting uh, waiting for this porter cabin to open. That's, yeah. a, that's a brilliant enough. story. Yeah, I mean, Joey was just really tough and aggressive and wholehearted, you know. But in those days, you could afford to dive in to tackles. I don't mean like dive in to hurt people, but, you know, you know a lot of things which would be a red card now, frankly, might be a foul and nothing else. Uh, if you look back even at games in the late 80s, you, you see tackles. So I, was, I saw a bit of that famous 4 old draw between Liverpool and Everton that Kenny Laglish resigned after. Some of the tackles, and now you're thinking, oh, he could be off for that. And then you re- realise the referee's carried on. He doesn't see it as a foul. The, the nature of tackling has massively changed, partly, I mean, I'm sure you realise, partly because of Marco van Basten, the great Dutch target man. Well, it's a target, mm. just a, one of the best all round strikers you could ever see. And he had to retire prematurely because he was great with his back to goal. He could take the ball in his chest, hold it up. So defenders are coming and kicking his Achilles all the time. He had to have like reconstructive surgery on his Achilles. And essentially, well, apparently it was um, because he was so badly injured with his Achilles, they tried some experimental stuff with him, which basically didn't work. And rather than let him play again, it stopped him from playing. But that's why they brought in the rule for the 94 World Cup that a tackle from behind is a straight red card. And although it doesn't always get applied now, but that was the rule and it worked. Because it yeah. was purely brought in because people rightly thought, well, if a player of the quality of Ambassador, who honestly was superb, 
player like him can be just kicked out of the game, we've got to do something about it. Um, but in the old days, if you went in hard, it's fine. If you if you got a little nick on the ball and then went through the guy, well, that's a tackle. And so well, Joey think, could do that, you know? I, f- I think this day and age as well, I think the speed that the players are going at as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think if you do those tackles like you did in the 80s, you'd be breaking people's legs left, right and centre, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think... I think I'm glad in the, on the whole, I do, you know, I, I am a bit of a weird, I, I got a bit of a weird theory. I think, you know, like tussles, I think referees send people off too early with like head to heads yeah. and people flopping on the floor after they've been brushed. You know, I think that's, I don't think, you know, from, from head to head or grabbing and things. I don't think like, you know, Tyler French is sending off the other week. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't think that should be a sending off. I think mm. the game's gone a little bit too soft that way, but, I think challenges, I don't like seeing big challenges that could potentially ruin yeah. young players' careers as well. So it, I, I'm, I'm missing like the, I, I think I'm in my head, I think like rugby league, if there's a bit of a tussle, mm. they get yellow carded and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Not sent off because of head to head or a bit of a headbutt or yeah. a, a bit of an argy bargy. I think, I think you should just, um, you know, let them calm down. It's a, it's a competitive sport. But I think on the other hand, I think I'm glad that big challenges don't happen anymore because you'd be seeing a lot less careers. Oh, yeah, absolutely right. I remember seeing a game, it was really odd, it was the last game of the season, us at home to Cambridge. And this would have been sort of 94, 95, something like that. And it was really clear that they knew Carl Connolly was a great player for us and they wanted to nullify him. And it was really clear that what they were doing was they were putting a man on him and that man was fouling him until he got boxed. And then they changed around and put a different man on him. And then he'd foul him until he got boxed. And I was watching the game, just, just being furious. Just thinking, I mean, it's so obvious what they're doing. Mm. Conley was getting kicked from pillar to post. It was absolutely despicable. And I was like, well, you know, come on, ref. Start reading the game. See what they're doing here. You know, because they were getting away with it. They picked up quite a few yellow cards. But Conley couldn't do anything. I remember we lost the game. Um, I don't know. Um, I'll tell you another couple of hard men, if that's all right. Um, Okay, first one. I've got no idea if he was a hard man or not, and his legend is exaggerated. But it used to be one of those facts, you know, those sort of facts the kids hear all the time, that a Wrexham player had the fastest ever sending off. A bloke called Ambrose Brown in the 50s, who was supposedly sent off after six seconds of the match, which is pretty decent going. Um, It's not true. The reports of the game say it's about six minutes, which is still a decent, decent effort. <laughs> yeah, that's you know, to be fair to the lads, but it's not six seconds, is it? you know. So um, yeah, that was uh, that was you know he's got to get some sort of little little footnote on that. And I was thinking this morning as well, another one. Um, oh, in the late seventies, when I don't know, was it when Joey left? No, we brought in Terry Darricott from Everton, who was assistant to Dean Saunders as well, and Darricott was like the epitome of a tough player. Mm. Um, he was a good, for the start, he was a good player. I mean, it, it, we'd gone up to the championship for the first time ever. We needed a bit more quality, perhaps. He was a really good right back. Uh, I always remember he, he was technically really good. And I know it sounds daft, but it shows how the technical level of football's changed. I remember he used to get the ball right back and with no pressure on him because the other side would, you know, in their own half, he'd switch it to the left back and the crowd would all be clapping because a player's passed it, the width of the pitch. Whereas now, I think you'd expect conference players to be able to do that, wouldn't you? But, yeah. you know, that, everybody was like, oh, look, he's a he's top left, first division player in, look at that. You know. <laughs> but that wasn't what he was there for. He wasn't an attacking fullback like he, you know, he didn't have so many attacking fullbacks then. He was hard as nails. Um, he little, it was it's strange. He was like, I guess it's odd to say this, he was, he was quite squat, square mm. sort of bloke. But he wasn't small. He must have been getting on towards six foot. But the, his proportion was almost like if you took like Jordan Shakiri and multiplied him by one and a half. He was <laughs> a big sized bloke, but he was a cube as well. And he was yeah. strong, real muscle. Ooh, he was hard to beat in a tackle, real toughness. And the sad thing is, after about in his first season, he basically got a very serious knee ligament injury that finished his career. Um, and I remember reading in the program that he'd gone to see the specialist. And they said the sort of injury he had, usually when people come in with it, um, they're, they're banging their head against the wall because they're in so much pain because it's so serious. And he was just like, he's just like sitting there. Um, but if, 
this was a tough man. He could take the punishment. But it's a shame we didn't get a full season out of him. But who he was he? He was a good player and he was a proper toughness. If you're going to tackle with him, you better, better check your insurance first. <laughs> It'd be interesting to see, you know, how tough the players were back in you know, the 40s and the, the 50s and the 60s because the, they were just usually just tough working blokes. Yeah. The sport was a lot a, a lot tougher back then, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, you know, way before either of us watched them, they, some of them would be working in the day and then go play in the evening, wouldn't they? Absolutely, so, yeah. Uh, so, and that, to me, that's hard and tough. If you're working down the mines and then going to play a 90-minute game of football, that's, that's tough, yeah. isn't it? Well, I was talking to Steve Massey about this, who's a, you know, a player in the 80s, our top scorer in Europe, and, and who still manages now. And he was really interesting about it, saying that he thinks... Well, I, was sort of, I was talking about injuries in a way, and, and, and how now we have multiple substitutions. In those days, we used to have one sub. In fact, going early in that, for a long time in football, there were no subs, and yet you know, there didn't seem to be an, an issue. Um, and I think that the, the faster pace of football uh, makes it necessary to make, you know, to be able to make more changes. Yeah. But I was saying to him, but surely when you get kicked in the Achilles, that that's as bad now as it was then. How come we didn't get so many players seem to be going off injured? You know, at first, when I was first watching football, the sub almost felt like it used to be in rugby that it was a an injury replacement or blood, but they got blood substitutes, don't they, in rugby union? Yeah, you know, yeah. If yeah. someone's hurt, you can bring somebody on. By the time I started watching it, people were starting to use a substitute. But often you wouldn't use your sub. Um, and he was saying, yeah, he said, he said that interesting difference he finds between when he was playing in the 80s and now is if a defender kicked him, because he's a striker, he, he felt it was his job to not show that he was hurt. Like a boxer, I suppose, getting punched. Yeah. Don't show your opponents you're hurt. He felt that he'd be at a disadvantage. The centre-back knew he could get at him physically. Um, whereas now... It's the opposite. It's if someone touches you, you go down and try and get about get the decision on the referee. Which I, I'm not trying to judge that. I'm just saying it's interesting how you know he felt he could withstand that. You know, it's, yeah. It's, but they did. They, they, they stand up for crunching tackles and want to stay on their feet because they were like, "Oh, I'm a man and I want to stay strong," isn't it? Back then, yeah. I think that was. I think maybe it's just a sign of the times now. Yeah. Yeah. Could be. <laughs> I think men were generally a lot tougher, weren't they, back then? I think it was harder. I don't and, really na- na- and now, like, as you said, you said perfectly then, it simulating's a big thing because getting a free kick and mm. penalties win your games, don't they? And I don't, I don't feel as judgmental about it, I think, as most people do. I, I understand that, you know, like the Southern, um, Southern European attitude in Italy and, and Spain of uh, you... Or Latin America, you, you do what you can to win the game. That shows yeah. your commitment. And if you can win that game by pulling off a crafty trick, or they call it, there's a book called Furbo, and that's the word for it in Italian, and it means sneakiness, but it's a compliment mm-hmm. in Italian. Because, it, because if you're sneaky and crafty, and you manage to get what you want by crafty techniques, then you're a winner, you're a, you're a clever person. Um, yeah. And and I, I I don't have as big an issue about diving as other people do because as you said earlier, someone going through two footed through someone's leg and breaking both bones is a damn sight worse than diving in a penalty area. <laughs> and, and yet in Britain, I think we tend to look at it the other way around and have this sort of holier than thou attitude of, oh, in Britain we don't cheat. Well, we do. Well, I have I have no problem. I have no problem with diving. It will mm. if 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 um. Let's say Dior Angus dives on Saturday and wins as a penalty, go. which yeah. wins as the game. I don't care. I'm, I'm angry when the other team does it. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. It's, it, I think it's just a part of the game, isn't it? And, it, and, that, and that, I agree. That, that says, isn't it? It's, it's, you know, you do what you can do and you get away with it and you love it and they do it and get away with it and you hate it. I think that's human nature, really. It's not a matter of goal, goal, isn't it, really? Yeah. Maradona handles that. And in Britain, we say he's a terrible man because he's a cheat. And in Argentina, they say... Well, I don't. I don't. I, I oh, think the right. English... A lot of Wrexham fans yeah. and Welsh fans don't, absolutely. <laughs> uh, sorry, probably the English people do. You know, look at yeah. Peter Hilton after Maradona died. Sort of basically going Still out Still very bitter. Very bitter about it. He should have come and cleared out. Maradona was five for four. I mean, for God's sake, Peter. Just want to make it, get to the ball first. But anyway, uh, <laughs> a different matter altogether. <laughs> sorry, Pete, if you're listening. I doubt you are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, I mean, in Argentina, he's worshipped because that was utter genius. We need to beat England, and he yeah. did it 
by <laughs> by pulling off that stunt. So, and I understand that. And it's the same. Some, I'll tell you something which I genuinely never understood. And if you cast your mind back, 2010 World Cup, um, it's a quarter final, Ghana against Uruguay, and <laughs> it's, it's level. Last minutes of added time. And Suarez, corner, yeah, and Suarez on the line, and Suarez handles it on the line, gives a penalty, and the penalty is missed. Suarez has been sent off, and I remember, I mean, the storm about that in Britain about the the, the cheat, and I, there were there were certain elements of, of uh, emotion, I think, getting in the way. I think people didn't like Suarez a lot of the time in Britain. Mm. I think as well the romance of an African team getting into the semi final, especially in Africa was attractive and I, I i was very attracted by that idea please don't get me yeah. wrong i thought it'd be wonderful but the fact I was is I, I i but but to be honest to look at it from suarez's point of view if that was a welsh player doing that i'd, get, I'd want him to have a nice husband you know if he didn't <laughs> stick his hand up then garner have won he stuck his hand up yeah. there's still a penalty so garner still should win win but jean missed it and then when it comes to the the shootout they blow it uh, Suarez has done something heroic, I would argue, yeah. for his country there. They want to get through. If he doesn't stick his hand up, they're out. It's, it's over. He sticks his hand well, up and he just gives them a, a shot. And they took that shot. Um, well, fo- football's a master's at diving now. I know we've gone off topic yeah. now, but, the, you know, look they at... They diving at, go hand in hand, don't they? <laughs> well, look, let's look at uh, Salah, Mane, yeah. Jack Grealish... Yeah. They, they're masters of it, aren't they? They're absolute masters of going down easy. And it's just a, a part of the game, but they're that good that they need to be tackled, don't they? And they're just masters going down, winning these free kicks. They win a free kick. You know, as I said, as I, said, I just said before, let's say, for example, I don't think he would, but Harris goes down or Jordan Davis goes down the edge of the box on Saturday and Luke Young scores the free kick. I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> We've won. <I'm> <laughs> we, we, we win from that free kick. Yeah. You don't care if it's your team, but if Wields turn up, for example, do the exact same thing on the other end, you're going to be furious. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be <laughs> frank. Football. I watch football because I love it. I watch Wrexham because I want to see us win. Yeah. I, I don't care how we win. I really genuinely don't care. I just want to see us win. Can I lob a hard man in to finish off? Go on, one last hard man. Oh, just one? Um, actually, I'll throw it. My dad, right? So my dad watched Wrexham during the Second World War. And in the 50s, he said there were a couple that really stood out for him. And one was a bloke called Billy Tudor, who was a fullback. Well, those fullbacks in those days essentially were centre backs. And he said he was just rock hard. And because those are the days of rock solid ball with lace across the front and you could tackle anyone however the heck you wanted. And, you know, proper sort of workman's boots. Uh, mm-hmm. You're playing in, and he used to say it was scary watching him tackle people. But he also said he remembered, and I'm, I'm, I'm not totally sure if he's got the right person identified here. He's saying Ron Wynn, who was also a sim- similar type of player, massive big fullback. Um, but I think it might be someone else he's thinking of with this incident. He said he remembered him having blonde hair, which he didn't. Um, but he said he remembers him going up for a header and splitting his head completely open because... The thing is, with those balls, apart from the fact that they, they absorbed water so they became heavier and heavier, um, the laces stood proud on the front. And so when the ball was not long, it was a lottery. If the, if the lace turned and faced you when you made contact, it's going to cut you. And so yeah. he split his head wide open. No substitutes in those days. So he just carried on playing. I mean, dad said he very clearly remembered, because of course your scalp is the part of your body that, that bleeds the most. He said that he just remembers that his blonde hair went totally red. Uh, is he carried on playing for the rest of the match and his head slowly covered completely to the point where his head was redder than the Wrexham shirt and his whole head covered in blood just carried on <laughs> okay that's pretty hard isn't it well yeah that's yeah, probably we, we, where we, we, we were talking the back. older generation yeah exactly that's what yeah. we stop our hard man chat I suspect isn't it yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we can top that I'm Luke Young and you're listening to the Dragon Heart Radio Show Right, we're back, and it's Hartlepool time, a game which splits people's opinions. I mean, I, I, I thought it was a good point to win. To be honest with you, I thought Hartlepool were good. They were better than us. The league table tells us they're better than us. Uh, but we dug in and you know got a point out of it. I, I'm quite happy with that, really. Yeah, I think, it's, I think if you're a cups half full or cups half empty sort <laughs> of guy, you can look at this sort of game however you want to look at it. Um, I personally look at it as 
both. I'm, I'm not happy. I'm not sad. I'm, I, I'm a bit annoyed that we didn't really create anything. We didn't really have any shots. We didn't threaten the keeper. Uh, that that was annoying. Um, but I'm really happy because I've looked. I looked at the Hartley Pool game prior to to us going into that game, and I thought Luke Armstrong is a fantastic striker, and he hit the post and hit skied it, which I um, two one and ones. So I thought he was going to score both. Mm. Uh, we nullified them. They didn't really do much either. I think a lot of Wrexham fans were complaining about us not creating chances. I think they only had a few more chances. Uh, it was one of them. I thought it was a solid point. The conditions were horrible. Yeah. And they were blowing pretty much from the cop end down the pitch. And that influenced the game because the first half had we were playing with the wind and dominated the game. And like I said, the first half, I was just very happy that we dug in and defended it very well. I mean, they started by halfway through the first half hitting some daft long-range shots because they'd stopped making chances. And after that first chance by him that hit the post, um, they didn't make many, they didn't really make any clear-cut chances. We didn't create anything. And then the second half, I thought we started it really well. And I thought, all right, it is that the wind is totally affecting this game. We had a few chances to put people in one-on-one, which we didn't take, which I assume is why Jarvis was taken off. Not because he wasn't getting involved, but because he wasn't Mm. playing that killer ball. And then, yeah, okay. I, I was a little concerned at how in the last sort of 15, 20 minutes, despite the fact that wind was behind us, that we, we did start to get overrun again. And we, that, that was when we rolled our luck a bit. I think the one-on-one, like you said. Then the one that hit the post, that's a, that's, a, that's a sharp chance because he's a good striker. He hit it really well. The one-on-one, yeah. we expect an informed striker probably to score. Um, the corner that misses everyone and goes just yeah. across the goal. I mean, my gosh, we were lucky. So how we survived that, that was very, very fortunate. But yeah, they didn't create that much considering that they were, you know, sort of putting us under a lot of pressure. I thought the three centre-backs were utterly outstanding. And, uh, you know, you said it to me after the match and then I spoke to Dean Keats after and he said exactly the same thing. We got four points off Hartlepool. It's good. Yeah. You know, well, you know, don't get me wrong. Uh, Keats was more dissatisfied than I was about it. He he did want us to get at Hartlepool more. Um, But, yeah, we have taken four points off Hartlepool. That is a positive. And like I said, the three centre-backs I thought were absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I, th- I think if any team should be angry after that game, it should be Hartlepool fans. Yeah, yeah, uh, for not winning it. Yeah. <laughs> really. Um, yeah. We we've now we played two games against them, uh, and we've won one, drew one, and mm. against a team that could win the playoffs. They're that good, I think. Well, uh, Reese Hope. Game, don't we? The Saturday before, yeah. and they were outstanding, weren't they? They they, they were they were brilliant, and um, I think. I think if we're going to be in the playoffs, if we're looking like we're going to lose games and we end up drawing them, for me that's not a terrible sign. No. Yeah. If, if 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 you could, if you're not going to win a game, yeah. you might as well draw it. <laughs> they were better on us, especially in the first yeah. half. So you don't go at them. You you make sure you stay in the game, and we defended extremely well. I thought we adapted well to their shape. The, the, our two midfielders going deeper because they had two centre mids that were trying to get forwards. Um, our wing backs stopped going forwards, and we had a, we were essentially you know they call it a broken team, don't they? Where your midfield's a bit absent because your midfield's deep, but then so you've got players up the pitch, players back, and a bit of a gap in between. And in a way, that the thing that we didn't execute well in the first half was that we were leaving Jarvis up with the strikers, and the idea of that was that we should be dangerous on the break. And we didn't find Jarvis or the strikers well enough. We tended to be hitting it back at Hartlepool. So, you know, but defensively, I thought we were very good, especially in the first half. Um, and we, the intention was for us to attack, but we just weren't quite able to. Would, would you wish that sometimes our players, rather than passing it out to either one of the fullbacks when we're on attack, just have a pop on goal sometimes? Especially like Luke Young. Durrell when he was on uh, even Davis can hit a ball quite well can't they and especially with the conditions of the game I think maybe it might have troubled the keeper a bit more but that again that's all ifs and buts isn't it well I mean yeah I mean, I mean the the obvious evidence of that is what happened on Saturday isn't it Nubel yeah. you know took a pop from outside the box and, and it, it probably wasn't good enough to be a goal but because of the huge deflection it was and you could argue uh, that yeah maybe you should, you should you should be able to have a goal 
Um, my dad, I always remember the first season I watched football, my dad complaining that Wrexham was sort of shot shy, everyone was passing the buck. They just need to shoot from outside, they just have more shots from distance, hit it. Try and work the keeper to start having a go. I can see the opposite side if you want to work a good position. But it yeah. Occasionally have a go. And like you say, Davis has got an excellent left foot on him. Uh, Durrell is a specialist on that sort of thing as well. Young's a specialist on that sort of thing. Wouldn't hurt to just try and test the keeper out a bit. Absolutely. And I think second half too, we were unlucky that Reese Hall Johnson come off because I, I think if uh, yeah, I think if Reese Hall Johnson was on, I think we may have even gotten been able to nick that. Um, but Horsfield did a good job when he came on. I'm not I'm not slagging off Horsfield mm-hmm. at all, but Reese Hall Johnson's our best player at the moment, isn't he? Especially going forward. Yeah, hold on. Uh, Horsfield, I like Horsfield a lot, but he's not going to start sprinting down the flank in 10 seconds, is he? Um, no. Record was pushing up a hell of a lot on the left-hand side. And if we'd been able to do that with Hall Johnson, that might have yeah, given us a bit more threat going forwards as well. That's a, uh, yeah, I, I'll take that point, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. It means that I lost one in eight, which is good. It, um, with a, a, you know, prom- a winnable game coming up on Saturday. Uh, and then after a tough game at Sutton, some other some more games against teams near the bottom of the table. You know, we, we've got to try and take that momentum of being difficult to beat and keep accumulating points and just just stay in there, hang in there, basically. And yeah, that's what we, exactly definitely. what we did on on Tuesday. And Wildstone's a must must win. Uh, games like that are must wins, and ban it after the Sutton games are must win. Yeah, yeah, th- yeah. We got to. St- I, that, that's a very fair point. These sorts of points you get against Hartlepool are great if you then follow them by winning the games that you ought to win. If you don't, yeah. then they're not so good. Yeah, yeah, I agree completely. Yeah, And I think some of the fans may be frustrated because, you know, we should have beat Dagenham. Yeah. Uh, we should have beat Eastley, really. Yeah, uh, yeah. Even though they're a good side, and I'm not saying they're not a bad, I'm not saying they're a bad side, but our performance merited a win. Yeah, the um, that, they? Yeah, I- exactly. And, um, but again, if we, if we beat Barnet and we beat Wealdstone and we get a draw against Sutton and then a similar performance as we did against Hartlepool against Sutton, mm. again, that's four points from a playoff team, isn't it? That's true, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, You're right in there. Just, yeah, we're, we're definitely right in there. And I, I, don't, I don't sign up, I don't side with the or oh, let's count off this season because we are still in the playoff positions. Yeah, I know there's teams around us with games in hand, but they have to win those games in hand. Yeah. So, yeah, for me, we're still right in it, and I think by drawing when we should be losing, uh, it's not it's not the world's worst sign. Exactly right. Exactly right. Uh, well, let's not stress about that anymore. After this, we'll have a chance at a man who always put a smile on our face, Hector Sam. Now we're out. Nice one. Right, so Hector Sammy. <laughs> should we go for him? Yes, we shall. Okay. Three, two, one. And Hector Sam. It's his birthday yesterday. Hector, a real trailblazer for the club coming over from Trinidad at the same time as Carlos Edwards as well. He was with us for five years, got 48 goals. Scored about one goal in four, to be fair. I, I must be, I was, I didn't think he was quite that prolific, um, but he was a good player for us, wasn't he? He was brilliant. I remember him when I was watching, because maybe towards the end of his start time at Wrexham, he was a bit of like a super sub, wasn't he? Yeah. He'd come on and tr- change a game. And I, I, to be honest, if we had the prime Hector Sam in this team now, we'd be laughing. <laughs> oh, yeah, gosh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was, he was, uh, oh. Right. What, what was your because when I used to watch him I was obviously a young child so what was your how was his game how was his style of play and how, how do you remember him uh, an awful lot of it of course was about his pace wasn't it really his ability to run in behind defenders yeah. and uh, and get into goal scoring situations and he started like an absolute house on fire so in the first nine games of uh, his season with us his first season, that is, he scored nine, eight goals. Um, I just remember the first one that very clearly it was a nice strike at Berry. I used to tend to be talking about us hammering Berry at, at Gig Lane in the East of Dog and Dragon Hearts. I enjoy it. <laughs> um, but we went there, we'd lost the first game of the season to Bristol City at home and really 
had, hadn't looked very good. And then we went to Barry and we just battered them 4-1. I know it was great to watch. And the pace of Sam was, was terrific. And he was really prolific in that early stage. And then it rather fell off that season for him. But, uh, yeah, he kept going. Like you said, sometimes he'd be a bit of a, a super sub. Um, I remember that the promotion season 2002-3 went. I mean, obviously, he was, he was for fourth choice striker, really, because we had yeah. Trundle, Morrell and uh, Lee Jones ahead of him. But, but once more, he scored some important goals. I remember our first home game that season, our first win was Hector Sam. Uh, scoring against Oxford after coming on as a sub late about, about four minutes left of the match and then next game but one we go to Macclesfield and oh, you know, Macclesfield is always a, a tough place for us to get a result yeah. and ten minutes from the end who pops up off the bench to score Hector Sam and we win one nil again and at the start of that season he made some really important contributions even though like I said he he wasn't he soon became essentially fourth choice in that season which is yeah it's it's amazing to think you, you say what would we give for Hector Sam now what would we give for Andy Morrell Lee Trundle oh. Hector oh, Sam yeah yeah Jones, oh. that'll be right wouldn't it <laughs> and then Mark oh, Jones is coming through in the background <laughs> yeah, yeah we'll bring him back but no I, I say if we had Hector Sam in the team now he would have been ideal for the game against Hartlepool wouldn't he yeah, yeah. coming on yeah. run well, he, he'd obviously be first choice striker wouldn't he but Imagine him coming on and scoring a goal in a game that we shouldn't be winning. Yeah. But for me, he was a real fan favourite and everyone loved him, didn't they? And him, the, the way everyone's writing about ha saying happy birthday to him on Twitter as it is now, he had really fond memories of him. And I remember being a kid, I used to love the chant, the, ch the chant we sung for Hector Sam. <laughs> and it, I, I actually remember him being one of the first players to sign my sign an autograph me Rex and play and he was such a lovely oh, wow. seemed like such a lovely man as well yeah yeah I mean all our Trinidadian players were, were nice fellas I think yeah and yeah they all came across it in, in different ways uh, their personalities as well I think Lawrence was was endearing to a great extent because he had that real fighting quality and fire in him and desire to improve whereas um, Edwards and Sam were your sort of cliched um, happy-go-lucky attacking players who, who weren't scared of anything and was would take on any challenge. But they, yeah, they were. Yeah, Sam was a smashing player for us. Also, the only man called Hector ever to play for Wrexham, which I think is the most important thing about him. Yeah, I did. I did, <laughs> I did not know that. And I, I was looking at. The, I remember actually having a memory of him scoring against us at oh. Warsaw, wasn't it? Do you, yeah. remember, do you remember that? I don't. He know. scored the header and he, and he didn't celebrate. Oh. I, remember, I remember, I remember loving that as a kid, and even some people were clapping him when he, when he was, when he come on and stuff. And I, no, I, really fond memories of Hector, um, and I, I think everyone, I think everyone, you can speak on behalf of the club, everyone loved him, didn't they? Oh, absolutely! Another memorable game uh, by him, I thought, was one of the early games under Dennis Smith, and we won three two at Wigan, and he scored. Oh, absolutely fabulous goal! Got the ball outside the box. And just did this mazy dribble through the whole Wigan defence and scored. It was absolutely magnificent. And I suppose the other thing that really sticks in my head about him is his penalties technique. Do you remember him taking penalties? He'd put the ball. <laughs> no, no. Oh, oh yeah. He put, put the ball. I remember trying to replicate this when my, my lad was about five and trying to replicate this with him. I couldn't do it. He'd put the ball down, turn his back, walk back to the edge of the D without looking back. And then we just suddenly spin round, sprinting. And oh hit. yes, I remember now. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 it's it's sort of come back to me. I don't recall him missing any. So fair play, he, was, he knew what he was doing. Just looked at the teams he's played for. He also played his last team he played for was called Police FC. Yeah, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's a big fan of Sting. Uh, about <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, he used to. Um, I, I, the one that sticks in my head for other clubs is the next club that he played for. I remember, because he left us to go to Port Vale. Yeah. And I that summer, that. I went to a test match at Old Trafford. And I saw a Port Vale fan with Sam on the back of his shirt. And I just thought, I don't know if I'd put a player, that I, is this is before pre-season. I, I don't know if I'd put the name of a player I'd never seen play on the back of my mm -hmm. shirt. I don't know if that's a bit too much of a gamble. I think he played four games with Port Vale, didn't he? In the, <laughs> so 
so yeah he didn't yeah go, maybe that lad should have held on a bit before putting his name on the back but um <laughs> no he was a he was a treat actor wasn't he or a lovely valor a lovely player and i'll always be um thankful for the the tri- the whole trinidad tobago crew and, yeah. and i think having that rex and trinidad and tobago thing was a really nice and cool thing to have wasn't it Absolutely. And yeah. having Dennis Lawrence being the only Wrexham player, was it to represent um, us in the World Cup, or have we had, have we had others? The only one who was a current Wrexham player. We had players who played for Wrexham, yeah. um, but Dennis Lawrence is the only one who, before you know, at the time, was a Wrexham player. We've had people yeah. like uh, Ron Hewitt, who was a local lad who was who played brilliantly for Wales in the '58 World Cup, but he just left us for Swansea. Um, Brilliantly. Carlos Edwards. Carlos Edwards, I beg your pardon. Yeah. Um, yeah, Sullivan's well. man. Oh, was yeah. he, he was injured, wasn't he, Sullivan's man? Was he, I think. And then, of course, um, the... Well, I, I, Don Ferguson, the only Canadian to play for Wrexham, uh, came to Wrexham partly because he'd been told he needs to play in a sort of proper league if he's going to keep his place in the squad. He was in the Canadian national squad and, and had some caps. And so we played for Wrexham for half a season and then was in the training camp for the World Cup, the only time Canada who qualifies, um, which he was telling me was like a sort of 25-man squad. But when they trimmed three players off it, he was one of the ones who was trimmed off. So he would have been, he would have got in there first. But did you know, Shade, the best Wrexham connection with the World Cup outside of Dennis Lawrence is when the USA beat, beat England in the 1958 World Cup in Chile? Because they're oh, captain. Wow. Their captain had been released by Wrexham, believe it or not. Ed wow. McElhenney, he was a, a journeyman Scottish player. He played for Wrexham for a little bit, and we got rid of him. And by all accounts, he, he wasn't anything terribly special. I think he was with us for about six months. And then he went around playing for other little clubs and emigrated to America. Uh, that American team was mostly British. They were, you know, because America soccer hadn't mm. caught on in America, and it was, it was British immigrants who naturalised. So he became an American citizen and was captain of the American team that beat England. And as a result of that, believe it or not, Man United signed him. And then I think he did play a little couple of times for United, but I think they probably looked at him and thought, hmm, maybe we shouldn't just buy a bloke because he's the captain of the team that beat England. Maybe we should invent scouting. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, that's quite a good link, isn't it? Uh, strange story. Yeah, very strange story. Very, very strange story. And definitely, for one for the future, Mark, we'll definitely do a Trinidad and Tobago episode of Dragonheart. Oh, yes. That's a deal. Excellent. That's a definite deal. <laughs> In that case, it's time for us to go anyway. So, as always, Jay, thanks for joining me. And Brilliant. we need to sign off as we're now planning something from across the Atlantic with a Hollywood send-off from Jay Harris. This is Jay Harris, and you're listening to Dragon Heart Radio. <laughs> Thanks very much for watching. Please subscribe as well so you don't miss out on any of our content, and click the bell to get notifications. <laughs>